see my book title is india an ink which is india an incorporated i think uh, everybody talks about india ink all the business papers as well as uh, the writings i thought uh, the non corporate india needs to be probed this idea came because there is a vegetable vendor near my home who comes around morning 6 o'clock and up to night 8 uh, she is around day after day 365 days so i always used to wonder where does she come in our economy she is doing a regular business she is not a you know pickpocket or any of those things and she has good the knowledge of the customer products and when i searched the literature in the central statistical organization i found she is classified under unorganized so i was very i would say very upset because she is much better organized than many multinational corporations 6 o'clock to 7 pm 8 pm day after day 365 days after some pages the classification of government is organized that made me much more uh, mad she is unorganized government is organized is something very funny anyhow this was the trigger point quite a number of years before i began to closely observe collect data analyze about the non corporate business in india they constitute approximately 50% of our gdp if you want to divide indian economy very quickly 20% is agriculture 20% is government 40 something like 10 12% is corporate and then the remaining is non corporate such a large share in the national income unfortunately they are called residual in our literature india is the only country where 50% of the national income generating activities are considered as residual so i wrote about it about their investment about their saving about their activities and other things this was the primary uh, motivation and i am glad the book seems to have done very well both initial chapters uh, look at the macro what is their share in national income what is their share in uh, expenditure what is their share in savings what is their share in investment all these things are covered initially uh, detailed estimates are given using data which is available and uh, the other portion is about uh, some of the specific uh, uh, illustrations and cases where some of these uh, uh, non corporate partnership proprietorship firms have done very well and what are the uh, trials and tribulations they undergo whenever we talk about ease of doing business we only look at uh, multinational corporations or fii and fdi and uh, you know foreign companies or indian big business but actually the ease of doing business is more critical for these uh, smaller fellows who are having innumerable amount of uh, regulatory framework shops and establishment act food and adulteration act stamp duty act you know and most of it is by the state government and there is a huge amount of corruption in this pr because most of these acts are in paper in practice what happen is the government inspectors come and collect money and there actually i have used a lot of uh, specific uh, instances and cases and i have also suggested what mechanisms could be adopted to minimize some of these uh, in terms of you know uh, what one can call uh, eliminating or reducing the uh, draconian power of these acts one second is how technology to some extent can help them actually many of them for instance uh, paying the commercial taxes or paying the property tax and other thing if we could do it through the uh, net through the it processes substantial amount of uh, uh, corruption can come down which has been observed in bangalore for instance many of the house properties you can pay it today through the internet and you don't have to have interaction at all with the employees in the corporation so that is uh, enormously facilitated in terms of the benefits to the ordinary you know so like that technology can to some extent it may not be able to completely eliminate help these uh, uh, small businesses the third point is even though we call them small some of them are not really small at all some of the tripur garment exporters have as i as 700 800 crore turnover 
some of the Sivakasi partnership firms who are in crackers uh, as well as in matches and uh, printing area, they have a turnover of 500-600 crores. Some of the BD manufacturers in uh, Karnataka, you know, Ganesh BD and other, have a turnover of, you know, 400-500 crores. So, what I want to stress is, non-corporate doesn't automatically mean very, very tiny or, you know, the puppet making businesses and other things. There is a huge amount of non-corporate which are actually into very large businesses, including the Surat, the diamond merchants, where uh, one of the largest export market is uh, there in the country. Primarily, it is defined in terms of being uh, not covered by the Companies Act, 1956 earlier, now it is 2013 actually. They are not corporate forms of organization, having a managing director, board of directors and uh, governed by the corporate norms and uh, laws. Significant number of them are proprietorship or partnership firms. Partnership in terms of, you know, maybe 10, 12 people and then uh, having conducting the affairs of the business. So, non-corporate is not covered by the company side. You may be interested to know two largest activity in India, Bollywood and cricket. Both of them are not corporate activities. BCCI says it is a charitable organization. It's not a corporate and it is association of persons. So, they are conducting the IPL and one of the, I think, richest in the world actually, but they don't come under any uh, corporate regulations or anything. Same thing, almost all the films made in Bollywood are under the non-corporate banner. Some of them, one or two of them have been tried as corporate, it didn't work out actually. So, this is how, you know, huge amount of uh, human activity in India is uh, not uh, corporate. No, there is not much of a... See, one is in this sector, by and large, very interesting, unlike corporate, uh, there is no showing off. Even people who are so-called ultra-rich, you may not recognize them that they are ultra-rich. Many of them may be traveling by uh, buses and other things, or dhoti clad and you know. One is the exhibition of uh, wealth is uh, frowned upon, by and large. Second is, many of them are not very highly educated. You can't... Uh, Tell them they went to Wharton or Harvard or anything. Most of them will be around uh, 10th and 11th class. I used to, uh, you know, I have a very, uh, you know, jovial way of, joke, jocular way of telling it that there is an inverse correlation between level of education and entrepreneurship in India. The more you are entrepreneurial, less you are educated. So, there is not much of a difference, uh, I would say, within the corporate, within the non-corporate. The reason is, the corporates have a problem in terms of imitating the US and uh, UK models. They have to, you know, and they get uh, interacted, they have people who have educated there, they have literature who have been produced there and other things. And these people are not, uh, you know, constrained by that actually. These people are bindas, you know. They feel that uh, the way they will do business is uh, the way they will continue to do business. There are uh, quite a number of... For instance, uh, a chapter, two, three chapters are devoted to caste as a social capital. What is the largest portion of Indian social capital is caste, which is not understood by many people in uh, management and business actually. If you look at many of the clusters in India like Tripur, like uh, Sivakasi, like uh, Surat, like uh, your uh, Jalandhar uh, and, uh, or your uh, Agra, uh, you know, a lot of these are specific product and uh, and lot of these are also class caste. It's not only within the country. Antwerp, one of the largest diamond center in the world, a small group of Palanpur Jains are controlling it actually. 70% today. Earlier it used to be 70% Jews. Today it is reverse. Wall Street Journal even wrote an article. First time Jews have been defeated in business without violence by the Gujaratis. So, caste is a major social capital. Unfortunately, we don't comprehend it. So, I have focused on how the groups which got into business have benefited immensely in caste. They are able to upgrade the entire caste to higher levels. How the caste which went into politics in terms of reservation, in terms of these things, they have not succeeded much in the social hierarchy. So, that aspect also I have focused. The importance of caste, how the caste uh, formations are facilitating the business, and uh, what type of internal, uh, you know, for instance, caste is used for provision of initial capital. The venture capital is provided by the caste members. 
to a new entrepreneur startups and uh, failure is recognized by the caste and they come to help you actually they provide uh, risk capital they provide access to market if somebody identifies a bigger market then he says why don't you go then to take that role so all these are dealt with in terms of uh, particularly among the newer forms of entrepreneurs traditional entrepreneurs are all from you know you can talk in terms of marwaris and uh, uh, banias and uh, you know but there is a huge new classes of entrepreneurs have come who are uh, actually benefiting immensely from the enlarged middle class as well as the huge amount of uh, uh, what one can call the market which has been unleashed yeah see 85% of india is self employed only 10 to 15% is either government jobs or big company jobs the self employed group obviously is a large consumer of uh, products and services in terms of you know for instance i could be a plumber or a carpenter or a uh, mason or a uh, electrical uh, repair worker or something i am also a consumer i am a self employed man but i am also a consumer actually so it's a huge basket of entire retail business you take maybe 3 4 crores are involved in this in our country retail stores retail shop kirana what american call it a uh, mom and pop store all of them in a sense are also consumers all the vegetable vendors in the country are also in a sense consumers right so they are you know they, by self employed what happen is you provide some amount of labor you also provide some amount of capital so it's a mixed income it's called in economic jargon the group one is uh, i think we must recognize the importance of the non corporate sector because all of our discussion regarding reforms all of our discussion regarding uh, regulatory framework changes everything is focused only on the corporate because they have a much uh, you know bigger say in television channels as well as in newspapers and uh, and uh, they you know the non corporate mostly they are dhoti clad and you know pan chewing and uh, they are not very sophisticated many of them are in the medium type and you know so first is we must recognize these people second is the credit availability to them should increase today most of them are dependent on uh, money lenders and uh, non bank finances and other thing where the rate of interest could be anywhere between 2 to 6% per month so that is another second uh, type of a third is most of them are self employed so they don't have any social security at all they have to work till they are 75 or 80 till they die and uh, many of them have this uh, currently the problem is declining joint family system and other thing so we must think of an appropriate social security net for them in the old age including health and other type of a uh, benefits last but not least is they must be recognized as a major engine of our economic growth instead of being treated as you know unorganized or residual or something like that i will tell a simple economic model i have developed my flower vendor i go and buy she measures it like this with her palm if i see both the bangles that mean economy is doing okay if i see one bangle that mean we are into a difficult situation if two bangles are missing we are in deep recession the reason is that bangle is used to buy her as a item of mortgage in uh, getting funds in getting funds this i have explained in two chapters in the book how gold is the most productive asset in our country everybody talks it is unproductive because they all see their wives their middle class the large portion of small businesses in this country use bank you know these gold ornaments as the mortgage for getting funds not from banks but from money lenders so i would like people to understand that gold is very productive it is very useful at that level because they don't have share they don't have bonds they don't have lic premium they don't have houses nothing so i would love students teachers professionals including professionals like you and uh, bankers policy makers and ordinary houses all the people to read this buy and read the book if they don't have time to read at least buy the book 